trying to navigate the storm chaser through the closed streets because of the power lines down. And you can actually see power crews still working out here. This could shift back to the west, so we don't want to let our guard down just yet. We're coming up on the largest debris that we've seen so far. It is getting weaker, but as it gets weaker, the wind field expands. Cyria, we're in the Shell Point area of Burton. The landfalling part of the hurricane is the most dangerous with storm surge and those hurricane winds. We do not have to worry about a direct landfall in Savannah. This stump is what's left from what the EF2 tornado took out. And you can actually see the path. The sunshine on my face that it is fantastic. We've lowered the rain chances. You made it through the hottest May in South Georgia on record. Our rainfall chances are actually going down as a major hurricane may make landfall. Now we're in the middle of a beautiful sunset and uh, red sky at night, sailor's delight or Santa's delight. The five o'clock advisory in from the National Hurricane Center and this is the end of the track with a major hurricane making landfall somewhere along the South Carolina through North Carolina coastline with the most damaging part of a landfalling hurricane most likely being in North Carolina. Dangerous storm surge and now over three feet of rain expected for parts of North Carolina. And that's Friday early afternoon. And then once it makes it into land, the steering currents kind of change and they actually almost stop. And that's the problem that we may encounter heading into the weekend as far as increased rain chances. The land falling part of the hurricane is the most dangerous with storm surge and those hurricane winds. We do not have to worry about a direct landfall in Savannah. We have to worry about the rains once that storm may meander towards us. These are the tropical spaghetti plots and they are in major agreements right here through North Carolina. There are a couple outliers and I know that you all have seen those outliers and we are going with the official hurricane track. So right now, Safe Touch Security first alert live radar, lots of lightning dance on your screen, but the storm that I was tracking along 301 south and 46 is raining itself out, didn't move much and that only took about 15 minutes from when I started tracking that. We do have some lightning south of Claxton along 25, Reedsville now along 23 between Reedsville and Glenville, seeing the heaviest rain and Cobbtown seeing a break and the rainfall has been largely along I-16 and north with a little couple of extra showers out here west of Vidalia and northeast of Hazelhurst. So Little Wissy got the rain last night and other places got the rain today. We are 88 in Savannah, 88 Cla 80 Claxton with some of that rain cooling, 90 in a non-rain cooled Hinesville and 91 in Jessup. And your evening planner, our rain chances taper off after sunset. We'll keep that slight chance of showers, that brief little downpour that kind of comes out of nowhere. And we're looking at our daily planner for Wednesday, which is very similar to today with a 40% chance of afternoon showers and storms and highs in the upper 80s near 90 for Savannah 91. Thursday, Friday with a landfalling hurricane to the north of us, we are looking at a 20% chance of showers and storms. So watch Thursday. This is one of the guidance models for the hurricane track. We're going to watch this make landfall somewhere along North Carolina and watch how we are dry in the coastal empire and low country. But big changes happen after Friday landfall as this kind of hangs out over land. That's why our rain chances greatly increase Saturday, Sunday, and maybe into Monday and Tuesday trying to navigate the storm chaser through the closed streets because of the power lines down. And you can actually see power crews still working out here. So they've uh, roped off some of the streets with this crime scene tape, but some of the tape is now gone and they are steadily trying to clear the roadways of power lines. Now take a look at some video of a house that we actually went inside of. This family, the Harringtons, they've been on Whitmarsh for years, almost 30 years now. And the tree that was not taken out by Matthew, that they decided to leave because they had so many beautiful oak trees up, they... <sighs> It came through their house, and you can see that uh, damage. The tree came down through the living room, and some of the limbs came down in the bedroom. Where do you go? You go to your bathroom. She had to scoop up her dog, and she had to grab her iPad and just quickly move into the safe space that she thought was safe, but she had to move out of the bedroom, so that was scary for her. This is what her son had to say when he got the word that his mom's house was hit. It, you know, it's one of those things, you know, you get... You don't really process it until you see it, and, uh, and to see the whole neighborhood the way it is with 
tractors and everything clearing the roads. It's, it's surreal when you actually see it. But after Hurricane Matthew, um, everything just kind of kind of just fits into place. This is all minor after Hurricane Matthew, so we're ready at all times. And the Harringtons were out clearing their home and helping clear other people's homes of tree debris and putting tarps on before the next rain comes. And it's inevitable during this summer season. So you're taking a live look from the WTOC Storm Chaser with our monitor in the back. A couple of videos, very compelling videos have been shared. And this is my Facebook page. I have it pulled up. And you can go look at those videos. The National Weather Service will be out here touring the damage tomorrow and taking a look at some of this video. Maybe it started as a water spout strengthen into an EF0, EF1. That's what they have to decide. They have to decide the strength of the storms that came through the islands tonight. Live on Whitmarsh, Jamie Ertle, WTOC Weather. It's yep. <laughs> coming in pretty good. Do you have insurance? Nope. What are you going to do? Do what I have to, all right. Only three times in 51 years has Jimmy Mason been worried about his house and the river rising, but fourth time was the, well, not so charming Irma. Irma brought the river so high, nobody could have imagined it. People here lost their dock, uh -huh. and the water came up to the top of the pilings, and the sailboat, if it had one more foot to go, we would have lost the sailboat and the dock. The new owner of the Shellman Fish Camp, a.k.a. Downtown Shellman, says he's been through David and Matthew, but this one... Because we were just overwhelmed this morning as we came down here, and, you know, it's like, it was no starting work today. The dock has structural damage, but Kersey says he's ready to get back to business. And I think we'll, we'll fare, we'll get through it and uh, make some changes that improve for the next storm, but uh, it certainly was an eye-opener. The surge was an eye-opener for all around. The assistant fire chief says it was nothing he could have prepared them for. But then you tell people about a storm surge, and unless they've seen it or been through it, they don't understand. Now, when we tell citizens, hey, we're going to have a six-foot storm surge, they know what to expect. And not only did Mr. Mason lose a lot of his home, he's concerned he may lose future business. I just hope it doesn't take all the shrimp and fish out. <laughs> And I'm trying to follow a big tide like that. Walking the streets of Lewis Avenue on Tybee Island, Irma damage is still very apparent. Shells of homes, piles of debris, and big trucks hauling in building materials. You can kind of see the water line up by that blue part. The watermark to most of us is a symbol, a red badge of survival. But to the emergency management, it's a tool they use to do an initial damage assessment. Previously, we had a paper method for collecting, and it just takes a long time. It's very gruesome to sort through the papers. Emergency management basically walking door to door through Chatham County with clipboards and cameras or their phones, and at the end of each day, matching those materials together. It became apparent through um, Matthew when these big stacks of papers are sitting down next to me, and I'm looking at them, and I'm just knowing it's not possible to get done in the time frame that it needed to be done. For Hurricane Matthew, we did approximately 14,000 field surveys over a five-day period, and that was a combined method of using a paper collection method and then some digital. Uh, for Hurricane Irma, we've gone all digital, and within three days, we did over 77,000 uh, property surveys. With the new app McKelvin helped develop with the Chatham County Engineering Department, the average time to do a windshield survey on a home is about 60 seconds. Remember, this is just looking at the outside, which is sometimes just that watermark. Whole neighborhoods can be assessed in hours, and FEMA in D.C. can watch those assessments in real time, determining what we need in aid faster. Having a proper method to document all this damage really made the difference for Irma. It feels great um, just knowing that people, we're able to give people a voice that they may not otherwise have. Um, and the speed in which we can bring aid to these people is just, no one's seen it yet in the country that I know of. We had no insurance, so this is as far as we got so far. You have to do a little bit at a time. <laughs> so. A year ago, Jimmy Mason let us into his Irma flooded home, and he says he's only about 10% on his way to recovery. So we got to put about 20 something pilings and wash them down, and then come in and redo the kitchen and the bathrooms and all. 
Just down the way, the hub and heart of this community, Shellman Fish Camp, had just come under new management. I was just getting my feet wet and then Irma showed up and everybody got wet. <laughs> Trey Kersey smiles, but he knew getting back to normal was important for more than just the residents of McIntosh County. So it was important to get it back up and running for them, not just for, for a, from a business owner, but uh, for them to have this place to enjoy. And, you know, some of them probably got more damage where they live. So to get away from repairs and things and come down here and have a nice weekend on the water was important as well. Gary Smith is president of Friends of Shellman Bluff, and he says the county helped them with debris removal for free, but another challenge remains. Of course, there's not that many dock builders, so they have to get in line, and uh, they're making a lot of progress. We'll be completely back up and running, or completely finished with all the storm damage sometime in the next few months. And while that may not be the case for Jimmy Mason, he stays so close to the water for one reason. As close to heaven as you're going to get without the real thing. <laughs> A World War II veteran is making his second trip across the country on foot. Ernie Andrus left St. Simons Island on his way to California, and our Jamie Ertel caught up with him just yesterday as he left the Peach State. All right, game on. Believe it or not, this is a, my running pace. It may be slow to some, but at 95, this World War II vet makes our time short with passages from his page in history. You, my job is to keep those Marines alive. Right. Never lost a patient the whole, my whole, the whole war. I had one that I set his stretcher down. I thought he was dead, but he moved his head. So me and the doctor didn't get along at all and he was my superior officer. We caught up with the Navy corpsman as he said goodbye to Georgia and begins his trek through Florida. Is Georgia still on your mind? Or are you chugging forward? <laughs> oh no, I'm, see I'm on memory lane now. He's been on memory lane since leaving St. Simons March 16th. I feel great. Good. Pretty amazing for enduring a heat wave in the coastal empire already and summer in the south ahead of him. You made it through the hottest May in South Georgia on record. Well, it was hot, but it, was, it wasn't too uncomfortable. Uh, people running with me thought it was very uncomfortable. Few people passed us, let alone run with us, considering we were on the road for two hours, but that didn't damper his spirits. It's fun trying. <laughs> American flag in hand, I ask. What was harder, World oh. War II or walking across country? Mm, World War II. <laughs> I think in World War II, you know, the whole thing was, you know, you're over there, you know, young people, you know, they go over there out of adventure more than anything else. Get in the action, you know, because they're indestructible. You know, I was, wasn't any different than any other teenager. But once you get over there, you start thinking about getting home alive. <laughs> yeah. At his pace, Ernie won't make it to the other side of the country until he's 100. But his purpose is clear. People should know that freedom is not free and what it takes to keep this country free. We were called on to do our part. The generations before us all had to do their part. Mm -hmm. And the future generations are probably gonna to have to do their part. Ernie's part in the Pacific Theater as a Navy corpsman is still fresh as this morning's do. See, once we put that airport on Tinian, I was there. We took a Saipan, then we took Tinian. Mm -hmm. our, our ship hauled the trucks in. We put them on top side. We took the trucks in with all the equipment to rebuild the airport. And that's where they flew the atomic bomb off of. Ernie says he was prepared to be at war much longer, and perhaps his sense of adventure and love of country is what keeps this American hero going on the long and sometimes lonely road to California. I'm not speeding. Jamie Ertle, WTOC News. Oh, I love him. Yeah, I love him too. What a beautiful <laughs> story. I just love the old war stories too, yeah. Jamie. You did such a fantastic job on that story. And there you all are you're with our video journalist, God, Jonathan yeah. Godwin, there yeah. with you yesterday. So they set out a little sign as his starting point, and his pace is about five miles 
per walking. So it from when he's when he's first adventure across the country because mm -hmm. he's from California, uh, that took him uh, from ninety three to ninety five. Wow. years old. Wow. Okay. And so now he's slowed down a little bit. So he said that it'll take him about until he's 100 to reach home in California. And he's doing this to promote awareness for veterans, veterans, for for uh, you know, he was a Navy corpsman. Mm -hmm. um, he was doing it for one of his ships. He raised $33,000 so far. You can go to coast to coast org, uh, coast to coast.org for funding him. Thanks, Jane. What a great story. Thank you all for joining us. Good night.